What's up, gangsters? It is time for my favorite and unfortunately very rarely repeated in 2019 uh, kind of video. A look what I finished video. <laughs> Uh, it's been it's been kind of a weird year because uh, it's now uh, November the second, and I've only done two of these videos so far this year. When one was a a uh, one tenth scale bust that I knocked out in just a couple of weeks because I needed a diversion, and then the other was my Tamiya one thirty second scale Spitfire that was part of my life for nearly a year. But, that's not to say that's all I've been working on. I've had other stuff going on, just kind of got into a weird thing of not getting anything done. But now I have, and this one's a little weird because not this isn't just a thing I finished. This is really four or maybe even five things I finished <laughs> because it's a little bit of a diorama. So, uh, this one involves four kits. Um, and I think that I've done like a part one of the two normal two-part build review thing on at least a couple of them. <laughs> I don't even remember, honestly. Uh, but it doesn't really matter because they're all getting wrapped up in this one collective thing. Since they are all now attached to the same base that's right here. But this will be uh, about the uh, Fujimi slash... Aoshima 124th scale Mini Cooper, the uh, uh, Maschinenkrieger Raptor, uh, which is a 120th scale kit, the Maschinenkrieger Krote, which is also 120th scale, and the last addition to this little scene, the Nuts Planet 124th scale silencer bane figure maybe you can see that that's the box and if you notice a sort of commonality with the scales yes i did believe that uh it was okay to mix 120th and 124th in this situation and i will leave it up to you to decide if it works so let's check it out
Okay, so there you go. There's what I managed to do with all of this. Um, and as usual, uh, now I'm going to talk a bit about the kits and uh, what I did. So anyway, let me just start. I don't know. Let me start from the bottom up uh, because uh, this thing has a base and uh, I put some effort into it, some of which I've talked about in my uh, randomly published 10 minutes of random videos, but this is one of these uh, 10 by 10 wood art boards, and these things are fantastic. Um, let's see, I don't have any of them sitting right here, but uh, they are awesome. They're made out of birch, I think, um, and basically it's just a, 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 a thin, like quarter inch plywood panel that's got uh, some framing on it, and I put some of those little furniture bumpers on the bottom to make it stand up a little bit, and that you get them in packs of like four, and I think this whole pack of four was like $15. Um, they're really made for painters, but I think they make fantastic uh, diorama bases. The only downside is that you, uh, you know, you, they only come in certain sizes and shapes. And so if you got one that works for you, then cool. Did this one work for me? Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the composition of this thing because I think I might have kind of shoehorned myself into working with this square format when maybe I really shouldn't have. I don't know. Um, but anyway, the, what I did with this base is uh, to create the effect of a section of Washington, D.C. freeway, I used this uh, 1 16th or 1 8th inch, whatever it is, uh, uh, cork. It's called fine grain cork. Um, and I felt like it made a pretty good facsimile of asphalt. If I was going to do it again, I probably would actually uh, cover this with some kind of a thick primer to fill in the pores because they look good from a, from a distance, but once you get up close, the illusion falls apart a little bit. But the texture overall, I think, is appropriate, at least at this scale. Um, there's other, obviously other ways to create an asphalt texture, but one thing I liked about this is that it was easy to create the cracks by just breaking the cork um, and then gluing it down. And then it's also easy to uh, cut like the lines in it that are there, you know, in the between sections of of uh, asphalt paving. And so I think overall it works pretty good, especially since you know this is not really a story about asphalt pavement. Um, as far as the sand dune back here goes, that was also a bit of an experiment because I honestly never made sand dunes before. And what I ended up doing there was I looked in my brand new AK Diorama book and they said use DAS clay. Now the stuff is called clay, but I think that's actually not true because when you open the package up, it immediately smells like wet newspaper. And that leads me to believe that it's actually paper mache. And when you work it, you can see that it's real fibrous and it doesn't, I mean, it kind of works like clay, but not so much. And what I ended up getting was a, was a pretty rough texture that had a lot of little cracks in it. And that was not a big deal, but that required several layers of smoothing to get to what I felt like was a decent looking set of sand dunes. And uh, so I added on some epoxy clay, which <laughs> is also not clay. It's two part epoxy putty that is shapeable with water for uh, a few hours after you, you put it down. And that, that helped me, you know, really kind of create the, the shapes, but I still didn't have a smooth enough texture everywhere. So I went back and used some just basic spackling compound, which is you know pretty good, and and it's very sandable. And I ended up doing a shit ton of sanding uh, on my sand dunes with my sanding sticks, which I still think is kind of amusing, but <laughs> I'm probably the only one. Anyhow, um, after they were all shaped the way I wanted, and it was a little bit of a challenge because what I decided to do was create 
most of the sand dune field with this big rectangular hole in it for the car and then do most of the painting and texturing on those then plant the car in there and form the sand around it where you know it's blown up against the body of the car and then drift it around the tires on the opposite side you can kind of see that so anyway the paint is 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 uh all just uh, it's actually the Steinel Res Neutral Yellow, which is a pretty good sand base color, uh, and then a lot of pigments. And I did some experimenting with pigments that I thought was pretty uh, educational and ended up being pretty effective. Um, I actually blew a lot of these pigments on there using my uh, air cannon of a 0.5 millimeter Iwata HPTH, um, which is great. I mean, this thing will practically blow rocks because it's got such a large needle. So what I would do is I, I, I've mixed up some fixer of my own using a um, an enamel clear varnish, which is available at any hardware store. That uh, needs to be enamel. Um, uh, and that's the basic material that pigment fix that like the ammo pigment fixer is made out of um, and so that because it's an enamel and it's it's mineral spirits or oil based whatever you want to call it it can be thinned down with regular old hardware store mineral spirits so i created a slightly thicker version of pigment fixer and then mixed the pigment into it uh, to whatever consistency I felt like I needed, and I sprayed it on a lot. And you can kind of see how that creates a kind of a gritty, sandy texture, which I wanted a little bit of, but I didn't want it to be over scale because, you know, a grain of sand, even at 120th or whatever, is, you know, basically going to be at, you know, atomic particle sized. So. At any rate, I you know I mixed the I mixed various shades of pigment to give me different shades, and tried to uh, you know kind of create some shadows and a little bit of depth there, rather than just making it all sort of monotone. And you know the reviews on the sand have been kind of mixed as far as you know whether or not it really looks realistic. But for me, the bottom line is that it just looked kind of boring when it was all one color. And I felt like this was uh, an effective way to make it uh, more interesting. Uh, so that's the sand. The sign, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> this, <laughs> this sign has been the subject of much debate and discussion on the old interwebs. Uh, this is basically, uh, this is a piece of tin coated steel that I had bought for something else and never used, and I felt like that the tin would be a good uh, approximation of galvanized steel. Um, galvanizing is zinc and tin, so anyway, the tone was about right and it looks metallic. You kind of can't see it anymore because of all the stuff going on here, but yes, freeway signs are made in multiple different ways. Some of them are like wood or particle board, some of them are aluminum, some of them are galvanized steel. I actually did do some research on freeway signs and they are not all one type. They aren't all made in sections, they aren't all riveted. Some of them are in fact just one piece of galvanized steel. So that's what I chose to use. Um, and then uh, what I did is I uh, sprayed some uh, hairspray on it, uh, laid down my, my colors, and did some, you know, started the whole process with some, you know, standard chipping, which I did in all my usual ways with sandpaper and a toothbrush. And I felt like that was pretty effective because I got a range of, of sizes and some pretty random distribution, which for me is what chipping was all about. The masks I made with my brand new Cricut uh, Portrait 2 cutter. Finally got myself one of those for 135 bucks on Amazon and super glad I did. And I got the, uh, the, the uh, art for the mask 
uh, from a stock photo site. Yes, I said photo. And that's important because a number of people have commented on the fact that there is no way that Interstate 66 goes west to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and if you look at a map, it's obvious why. And I mean, some of these people live there uh, because Interstate 66 basically goes west from Washington, D.C. But this apparently is a photograph. It's on a stock photo site. That's all I can say. And there, uh, one guy who lives there broke it down and said, look, there's a place on the freeway where this can actually happen. I mean, look, I didn't know. I just thought it was a great graphic. I, I googled Washington, D.C. freeway sign because that's what I wanted, and this is what I got, and then, of course, found out after the fact that it would probably have been more effective if this had said east. But it doesn't, so it is what it is. Now, what I could not mask was the Interstate 66 sign. I uh, might have gotten away with the red and the blue and the white letters um, and maybe even the outline, but interstate, yeah, way too small. So that's just a decal that I created and printed, and uh, that worked out pretty good. Anyway, once I had mixed up the colors, and yeah, no, uh, as far as I know, nobody makes the reflective white paint that the letters are supposed to be, or the actual freeway sign green. <laughs> um, but yeah, relatively easy to mix those with MRP. But hey, at least I have the font correct. This is in fact Highway Gothic. <laughs> so there is at least one thing about this freeway sign that is factually correct. Nonetheless, I feel like that it does its job, which is to become kind of the what I call the fulcrum of this little story, which is admittedly kind of subtle. Um, and this is where I'll talk about the composition of this thing. Um, the whole idea that I wanted out of this was to create uh, a scene that would basically, uh, you know, get you thinking about some sort of dystopian post-apocalyptic future where things had gone very, very badly wrong. And, you know, the iconic location that everybody recognizes is obviously Washington, D.C. And if you've got sand dunes in Washington, D.C., obviously things are not as they're supposed to be. And I initially started out the idea with just one robot and one rusty car. But I couldn't get the, you know, the pre-built uh, base that I wanted in the correct size. And then I started thinking maybe square. And then I started thinking, well, maybe I should add this other robot. We'll call him Dopey. That seems kind of like a good name. And it, basically the whole thing here is that it's supposed to be that these guys are, have, you know, come along, they've seen this sort of death's head warning, um, and they're standing there looking at whatever it is that caused somebody to paint the death's head warning off there in Washington, D.C. with this whole kind of WTF expression. And yeah, it's pretty subtle. I mean, how do you get robots to be, <laughs> have an expression? And that's why Dopey is just standing there with his arms hanging down, doing nothing, because he's like, you know, whatever. Now, I know, I know, he's not strictly a robot. We'll get to that. But nonetheless, that's the deal. And uh, it may be too subtle. I don't know. I have a thing for subtle humor and... And uh, this one just may be too much. I don't know. But then I decided when I was getting close to the end um, that uh, I wanted to add a figure. And that's where this Nuts Planet uh, guy came in. I just felt like he would be a good addition to the whole thing, especially given his sort of relaxed but at the ready pose. So, um, at any rate... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the story here that I was trying to create. Whether or not I did, I don't know. You know, this is the kind of thing where you, you get pretty far into it and you're committed. 
And, you know, at a certain point, there's just really no turning back. And all you can do is finish it out and hope for the best. So I feel pretty good about the way that the thing turned out overall. I feel pretty good about the individual uh, elements as far as how they turned out. Um, you know, and if I decide over time that the layout is not good, then worst case is I can just take these guys and take them off because these three people, people, whatever, robots, are attached with magnets, you can see there. And that's one of my favorite things because for obvious reasons. So, and you know, if I ever decide to transport it any place, then that'll also make things easier. So these three are attached with magnets. Uh, obviously, the Mini Cooper is pretty well buried in plaster and is not coming out with anything short of a jackhammer. So, but at any rate, that's the deal. Now, let me move on to talking about each of the individual elements. Okay, so uh, let's start with the uh, Mini Cooper. What I wanted uh, for this thing was a car that was iconic, but yet uh, showed the uh, complete stoppage of everyday life as we know it. And hey, I felt like I was pretty lucky to find a Mini Cooper kit because, you know, what better example of that uh, than something like a Cooper. Uh, everybody recognizes it. Uh, it's a daily driver. So anyway, I thought this was pretty good. And I I'm not sure if this is originally Fujimi or, or Aoshima, but uh, they both have one. They, it, it comes boxed from both. Um, so uh, it's easy to get, but I had to order it from Japan. And uh, it was like 35 bucks, I think, maybe about maybe closer to 50 by the time I paid shipping. Um, and I didn't really have much issue with the kit. I mean, even as crappy as I feel like most car kits are, this one wasn't too bad. Um, the fit and the engineering was kind of typical of car kits where everything kind of falls together. I didn't have to adjust any parts to make them fit, uh, which was nice with... Um, you know, little details like these little louvers that go in the side here, they drop right in, the door handles. You know, that kind of stuff that you've got to add after you do all the bodywork and paint on a car model. You really want that stuff to just fit, and it all did, so I was pleased with that. One thing, however, that was really disappointing was the fit between the interior tub and the body shell. It had an enormous gap all the way around the edge. I mean, like two millimeters or more. And that was not going to work because obviously with the glass not being in here, there was no way to hide that. You know, it's got this this black outline around the uh, all the windows that, that hides some of that if you're building it, you know, factory fresh, but that wasn't going to work for me, so... I ended up taking a piece of two millimeter square uh, styrene and wrapping it all the way around the edge of the tub and, you know, then doing some, some filling and sanding. And I didn't figure that out until I'd already done all of the painting and weathering pretty much on the, in, on the inside there. So that was kind of a hassle, but, you know, ultimately got it resolved. But you can still kind of see, I don't know if I can get the angle uh, correct with the camera, but if you look in there just the right way, you can see, there it is, <laughs> look at the gap between the top of the dashboard and the bottom edge of the windshield. You can see all the way through the front fender. <laughs> so that's pretty terrible. But uh, you know, that was really the only major issue I had with it. So, it, you know, I guess all's well that ends mostly well. So, speaking of glass, I wanted to have broken glass in there. I don't know if the camera's going to really want to focus inside there, but there we go. That's not bad. So, what did I do there? Those are uh, crushed up microscope slide covers. Those are the little squares of really, really thin glass that you put over the top of the sample on a microscope slide. 
and I crushed them up really small, put them all in there, thought it looked cool, showed the dudes on Scale Modeler's Critique Group, and they were like, that looks like ass. Because, you know, side windows on a car shatter into thousands of tiny pieces. <laughs> so I removed it all, crushed them up finer, did it again. And they were right, of course. It does look better this way. And this is also part of the reason why I did not fill the car with sand, because this was another contentious point was if you got all this sand drifted up around the outside of it, why is it not full of sand on the inside? And, you know, the fundamental thing is not all sand is created equal and not all conditions are created equal. Some sand is very large-grained and heavy. Some sand is very fine-grained and light and blows all around. And the truth is, we don't even know why the sand is here. I mean, it might have been from a flood. Who knows? But the bottom line is that I wanted to be able to show some of the interior with the broken glass. Now, the interior itself is a bit of a problem because there's some timeline sort of discrepancies here that I kind of just had to choose to, you know, ignore. Um, because, here's the thing. This is supposed to be a scene from anywhere between let's say 25 and 125 years from now uh, this is a 2005 ish mini cooper so you know now ish so the problem with that is number one the machining krieger purists are already going to be pissed off because all of this machining krieger stuff is as i understand it supposed to be taking place like 300 years from now yeah, well, so kind of had to blow that off because I wanted a rusty car and I wanted to still have a little bit of paint on it and that's all pretty realistic. I mean, I could show you examples all around the farm where I live of cars that are close to 100 years old that look like this. And so I'm okay with that, but there are two things that I'm not totally okay with that I kind of had to accept. One is the tires. Now what happens to tires when they sit out baking in the sun and the dry heat for decades is they basically turn into a super hard as a rock, semi shiny black cracked kind of compound. And it's really, you know, pretty black. It's not the kind of grayish color that tires that are in use uh, display. The problem is that to create that look, I was going to have to use some paint tricks. And these are vinyl tires. And you know you're not doing a lot of paint tricks on vinyl tires. So I had to compromise there. I ended up just giving them a kind of a gray oil wash because that looked better than just leaving them black. It looked more believable even though it's really not sort of what I would call accurate. So yeah, it is what it is. The other thing is that the interior of a car uh, that's that old is going to have the vinyl and leather uh, pretty much cracked and peeled completely away. And I simulated some of that with some paint tricks. You can see where I did some chipping in there to reveal a foam rubber color underneath the, uh, the gray of the, of the seats. Yeah, yeah, so I kind of, yeah. But really, that vinyl seat covering should all be cracked and peeling off to reveal the springs and the framework underneath the seat. And that right there is the same reason why I didn't do my original intent of making the car a burnout. Because I was going to have to do a bunch of scratch building on the interior to create the proper look of, of those seats. And honestly, I just decided I didn't, I didn't care enough about this particular element to do that. Because really what this thing is, is this is a supplementer, this is a, a supporting actor, if you want to call it that, okay? These guys are the main characters. This is the fulcrum of the story. This is a supporting actor. And the fulcrum and the supporting actor kind of just serve to create the scene and plant it, uh, it you know, in its place in the timeline. So I just kind of wanted to blow off those details. But, you know, I mean, really, if I'd been super dedicated, I would have just buckled down and done all that scratch building. But 
I still think that overall it, it serves the purpose. Um, now, as far as uh, the weathering and paint on this, um, I'm not going to get into just a, a whole bunch of details with all that because there's just not enough time with this video, but I did something a little different with this one. I'd been wanting to uh, try doing all my rust base coats with MRP, and I did that this time. Um, MRP has come out now with some really good rust tones. I'd like to believe, at least partly because of my badgering Martin Schneider about it, because I do think that it'll be a, a good seller for him. But I took some of their existing rust-ish tones and did a bunch of mixing, and it worked out pretty well. I, I liked it. Um, I've always used uh, this mix of uh, rust-colored Steinal Res in the past. Um, and hold on a second. Got a little bit of weirdness going on over here. For some reason with my lazy Susan. And wow, okay, this is weird. Somehow my entire paint booth has shifted. <laughs> Can't really see it. Yeah weird. Hold on a second. Yes, my entire giant paint booth has somehow shifted and is now up against my Lazy Susan and the Lazy Susan won't turn. And I have no idea how that could have happened. That is extremely spooky and weird. Anyhow, I've used this blend of Steinal Res rust color as my rust base for most all of my rusty things and it works great but the truth is that for some reason mrp really really sticks hard to uh steinal res and it doesn't chip as easily as i'd like for it to uh, and mrp is already a little harder and and so uh, what i'd been doing was applying a coat of aqua gloss over the steinal res before I put down the hairspray and then the MRP. I decided I wanted to try and shorten that process uh, by just using MRP for everything because it chips off of itself very nicely. And that did prove to be a, a, good, a good plan here. I did my thing of, of sanding the color coats first to create these, you know, kind of, kind of fades. Um, a lot of strategic spraying don't put paint where you know it's not gonna gonna still exist um, and then came back and did the chipping and I tried to create some differentiation between the uh, you know like the doors because they might have had a different sort of uh, corrosion prevention on them um, you know just to, to break it up a little bit and, and so I feel pretty good about the way all that turned out uh, this is by far the most extensive rust project that I've done and I was pretty happy uh, with with the results and then of course there's some oil work and so forth to create the uh, uh, the, the, the rust stains the uh, skull um, is hand painted with uh, some Windsor Newton oils I just uh, looked on the internet for illustrations of skulls and picked one that I thought looked cool and kinda went with that style but just tried to do my own thing, and I was, I was pretty stoked with the way that turned out. Tried to show some sort of dripping there. The, uh, uh, you know, the plastic lens covers on modern car headlights do this thing where they cloud up and turn yellow, and I did that with some really thin MRP. The chipping on the chrome was a little bit of, uh, of a hassle. I tried to do some selective removal with applying um oven cleaner and that just didn't work out well i tried doing some masking uh, using masking fluid and some oven cleaner and of course the oven cleaner just wrecked the uh the masking fluids that doesn't work so what i actually ended up doing was just painting the chips uh painting the black over the top of the chrome for the most part uh using masking fluid uh, to get good chipping shapes and uh, some sponge work. And I feel like it turned out pretty well. I feel like it was pretty effective at creating the look of, of uh, vacuum metalized chrome, which is the same kind of chrome that's actually in our model kits. Uh, that's what they use on, on uh, chrome-plated plastic parts in the automotive industry as well. 
and it flakes off eventually. Um, and then I felt like that did a, a pretty, pretty uh, nice job of, of replicating that. So anyway, this video is going to be long anyway, so I might as well tell you a quick funny story time. <laughs> I think it's funny anyway, with this Mini Cooper. So my original plan was to chop the thing in half and have it be flush up against the side of the base because I felt like only half the car was really necessary to tell the story. And that was when I was originally going to only have the car and Stompy. Well, as things evolved, I realized that I just wasn't going to be able to do the things with the interior that I really needed to do if I chopped it in half. And it was just was not, I just couldn't see my way to, to doing it effectively. But all of my original um, sort of, of dry fitting and conceptual layout stuff was done on that basis. And I had, uh, you know, put the front wheels on the, on, the, on the raw chassis and, you know, had the body kind of dry fit on there. And, and I did all that back in like January. And then I put the stuff in the box and set it aside so that I could work on other stuff. I came back to it then about three months later and was studying on it and then I came to the conclusion, uh, oh, I'm going to really not do that and I'm going to need all four wheels. Well, so I started looking through the box and I was looking all around my bench and I couldn't find the rear wheels. And I was like, holy shit, I'm an idiot. I got so convinced that I wasn't going to need anything on the back half of the car that I just threw away the rear wheels. What a dumbass. <laughs> But it's the kind of thing I've done. So I ordered another kit from Japan. <laughs> and this was, you know, and, and, and over the course of the next few weeks, I was waiting for the kit. I didn't really need it, but I was continuing to kind of work on some other things. And one day I was sitting here at my bench and I happened to just be sort of looking around and, and I looked up on the 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 at the place where the where the box was that had all this stuff in it. And I noticed that I had the, I had the box, you know, lid inside the box kind of thing, but it was kind of sitting at a weird angle. And I was like, that's weird. Why is the box in the box sitting at an angle? I, so I picked it up, took the box out of the box and looked and sure enough, the fucking rear wheels were underneath the box lid that was inside the box <laughs> and making it sit crooked. So I was like, well, damn it. Now I have this kit that I don't need that I've just paid another 50 bucks for that's coming from Japan. Well, it never showed up and never showed up and never showed up. And so finally I emailed the hobby shop in Japan and I was like, hey, I never got my kit. And I was actually kind of relieved because now I don't need it, right? Because I found the rear wheels. And they emailed back. They were really nice. And they said, hey, if it doesn't show up in the next couple of days, let us know. We'll refund your PayPal. I was like, awesome, domo arigato. And sure enough, the next day, <laughs> the second kit showed up. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, I ended up just giving the second kit away. So, uh, anyway, I guess all's well that ends well on that one, too. That's my funny story time about, you know, not uh, keeping track of my stuff. Okay, so, anyhow... Let's go back to, uh, let's move on to the next major element in the story, which is Stompy. Now, Stompy is really kind of what this thing is all centered around, and, I, and it's my favorite part. Um, and I spent a lot of time, that I, some of which I documented um, along the way, doing as much detailing and, and improving as I could on the kit. Um, I, this kit, I think, is a wave kit. I don't think it's one of the Neato kits. I think it, I think it is a wave kit. I don't think it's Hasegawa like some of the other Machine and Krieger stuff is. But regardless, it's a pretty cool kit. But like a lot of the Machine and Krieger stuff, it's pretty simplified. And uh, it goes together well, but you don't get a lot of, of, of great detail. And so I just decided, look, I'm going to do everything I can. Um, they, uh, they give you some nice copper wire in the kit so that you can make better handles for this kind of stuff. And I, I, I did that. Um, but other than that, you're really pretty much on your own. And so, 
some of the things I did. Um, I added uh, lots of resin nuts and bolts. You can see there. Um, there's some right there. I substituted a brass tube for that actuator rod uh, on the on the, the the spotlight, whatever that thing is. Um, the uh, the red or orange safety light lens, which is one of my favorite things. I kind of like it because it's sort of incongruous, but I feel like it's legit. You know, you might need a safety light when your robot is in the maintenance bay. You know, and his maintenance code has been scanned or, or whatever. And if you look over there, you can see that there's also one that I added to the top of Dopey. So uh, that's from a 1-6 uh, Tamiya Honda Monkey mini bike kit. It just, it, the whole housing there fit really nicely in that spot. Um, and, you know, there's just a few little things like that around that I added on. Um, but the main thing that I did was I created a what I hope is a good cast metal texture for this, which I think I talked about before. But basically, I did that using Mr. Surfacer 500 that I put on with a sponge and then sanded kind of flat so that it gives me these, you know, uh, gives me all that. Uh, that uh, relief that then when I came back and sanded the color coats brought out the rust tones from underneath and I think created a, a really uh, authentic cast metal look and a lot of just nice random patterns my favorite kind of thing um, so let's see what else oh um, these hoses are, are actually springs that they give you in the kit and I think they look really good but uh, the shocks and the cylinders, not so much. Um, so I substituted some nice stainless steel tubing for the uh, shafts on the cylinder and the shock, and I think that really adds a lot. They give you two, two versions of the shock in the kit. Um, one is just a single molded piece, and then the other one is a, you know gives you separate pieces but the shock shaft is still just plastic. And so I, I, I substituted some stainless steel tubing there as well. And I think that adds a, a lot to it. But now this is the point to talk about the leg because the Machine and Krieger purists are already frothing at the mouth because the legs are on backwards. <laughs> well, they're maybe they're on backwards. That kind of depends on whether or not you believe that they were correct in the original kit design anyway. And yes, I realize it's heresy to question what Sensei Yokoyama did with the original kit design, but hey, that's just how it is. The original kit design has the legs facing the other direction, and so this whole foot thing is kind of dragging behind. And not only do I just disagree that that's not I mean, with the, that being an efficient way for, for him to walk. I mean, yeah, there's a video on YouTube that kind of shows him walking, but if you look at it, it's really pretty oversimplified. It doesn't really show the legs actually articulating. And so I not only do I not think that that's really a great way for him to be walking, because look at nature. You know, just look at a chicken. This is the way that a chicken leg actually is. You got the big thigh bone, then you got the, or the wing, or whatever, well, not, not the wing, but you got the big thigh bone, then there's a smaller leg bone, and then there's the whole foot thing. That's just how nature has done it, and I feel like it's just got to be that way for a good reason. But I also just happen to think it looks better this way, so that's my story. I'm sticking to it. You guys can send all the hate my way that you want for my backwards legs. I am going to go down fighting that that is actually the best way. But here's the thing. If you look at this, this is really just kind of kind of silly because no matter how you position the legs, they're not going to work. All right? Just look at this for a second. You'll notice that this cylinder is maxed out. It's fully extended, okay? Which should mean that this shock spring is fully compressed but it's obviously not. It also is fully extended in this position. So, if you try to retract this cylinder and pull this pivot up 
to extend the leg, you can't because this thing can't get any longer. Likewise, if he's going to try and squat, bend at the knee right here, in other words, and compress the shock, this cylinder can't extend any further. So if, <laughs> basically, this leg is locked in this position no matter which direction they're facing, and the only thing Stompy can do is pivot right here at the hip and using electric motors or whatever is going on down here at the ankle and foot assembly. So look, really, I mean, come on. If you're gonna get really precious about the way these uh, legs are positioned, you're gonna also have to answer for the fact that the entire design is mechanically problematic. So anyhow, that's that's the deal with, with Stompy. Um, I tried to create a nice freehand camouflage pattern on him, and I did that using my Sotar. Um, just wanted something that was, you know, military, but a little different. And uh, so, uh, let's see. The weathering, and this applies to both Stompy and Dopey, um, the weathering is basically all stuff that is straight out of Rinaldi's tank art books. I don't think anybody goes into more detail and explains it better than Mike does. And I think his techniques and the way he applies them are the most authentic. Um, you know, one of his things is to try and bring, um, you know, you bring the model to the intersection of, of aesthetically pleasing and realistic. And that's kind of what uh, I've, I call authenticity. Um, and so I, I just, you know, tried really hard to incorporate as much of that as possible. So there's a lot of pigment work. There's a lot of oil paint rendering. Um, you know, I've got other videos that talk about the details of doing that. So again, in the amount of time I have, I'm not going to get into all of those details. But hopefully you can identify each of the effects because that's one of the key things with the way that, that Mike does his work is... The control is such that you can see each specific effect and technique. So hopefully when you look at the top of, of Stompy's turret, you can see that it starts with the very bottom layer where I did the sanding to reveal the rust for underneath the paint. Then there's tonal variation within the paint itself that was all sprayed on. Um, then my next thing was to come along with some oil washes that were, you know, to create some dust tones. One thing R Rinaldi does is, is he uses pigments a lot on lower uh, parts of things like tanks and then uses oils to create dust on upper surfaces where, it, you know, it's kind of just more about discoloration rather than a collection of, of, of mud and dirt. And so that's what I did here. Um, and then, uh, and I did some sponge work with the oils. Then my last effect was a little bit of splattering. Just, you know, people dropping and dripping oil and fuel and grease and, and stuff like that. And then came along and did some rust streaks. So, you know, I, I feel like it's a, a pretty nice collection of layers and, I, and hopefully it does a good job of, of telling the story. Okay, so uh, trying to push through and get this thing done before I run out of space on my on my card. Uh, Dopey, okay, let's talk about Dopey for a minute. This is also, I think, one of the wave kits called the Raptor. And there's a number of different versions of these things um, that are all kind of similar. Uh, and they all have the common assembly architecture, which is kind of interesting because it's really unlike Stompy, which is really a, mostly like a traditional injection molded kit. Um, Dopey is an injection molded kit that's really in, uh, intended to be a press fit assembly. Not snap fit, but press fit. And it took me a little bit to figure that out. Um, and, and a lot of the fit uh, between parts is really tight. But you've got uh, a collection of regular polystyrene parts as well as vinyl parts because all of the hinges are or joints whatever you want to call them and as and those hoses as well are 
intended to pop together and allow you to pose the thing. And the poseability really is pretty good. You can do a lot of fun things with the posing on this. So, uh, you know, some people have been like, well, you know, Dopey's pose just really doesn't do it for me. He just looks very static. And, and again, my whole intent here was to make Dopey <laughs> look dopey. Like he's just kind of standing there going, what in the actual ass just happened here? And so that's why he's just standing there. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's too subtle. But if I decided, though, you know, that I didn't like it, uh, or I wanted to remove him from this and use him somewhere else, I can pretty much change his pose to anything that I want. So that's a good thing. Um, the uh, uh, Now, here's, here's the thing, okay, uh, that I have to address because... Again, the Machine and Krieger purists are, are, are protesting this because Stompy is a robot. I don't think there's any disagreement with that. Dopey, on the other hand, is not supposed to be a robot in the purity of the Machine and Krieger universe. He is supposed to be some kind of powered mechanical suit. Well, yeah, the problem with that that I had is, first, he's anatomically impossible. I mean, if you look at it, and you look at these things when they're built with the hatch open and the, the head in there of the guy driving it or whatever, you can see it's just not working. I mean, those arms, for one thing, are just way too long. His elbows are basically at his shoulders, so it just doesn't work. But here's the other problem that I had in particular, okay? The car kit is 1 20th scale. These, no, sorry, the car kit is 1 24th scale. The robots, and yes, I'm saying Dopey is in fact a unmanned combat biped. He's a robot. Uh, they're 1 20th scale, which means that they're basically 20% larger than the car. Which means that any human being stuck inside the Stompy suit or the Dopey suit is way too big for the car. So that just fundamentally was not going to work, and that's part of why I made the hat, the top of his hatch closed. I mean, he wasn't going to look right with it open anyway, but bottom line is, yeah, he has to be a robot in order for the car thing to be appropriately scaled. And I felt like I could get away with it because unlike sticking a 132nd scale ME109 on a 135th scale truck bed, Nobody knows how big these things are really supposed to be, so it doesn't screw, it doesn't look stupid, okay? Uh, it just, you know, again, if you know the hierarchy, or not the hierarchy, if you know the, the story of Machine and Krieger, yeah, maybe it looks dumb, but yeah, again, I, I didn't have much choice because there was no way I was getting a car in 120th scale that was going to work for this. Then, when I decided to do the figure, that all worked out because... He's a 124th scale figure, so he works perfectly with the car. And yeah, he might look a little small for Dopey's suit, but again, it is what it is. Okay, so this video is going to end up being pretty long, but it is what it is. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not spend a little time talking about the paint on Dopey here, because that's, that's something that I have never tried before. Um, so there's this tradition in... Uh, machining Krieger and really kind of in Japanese modeling in general with brush painting lacquers. Now I know that's immediately making some people's skin crawl. I know it did mine the first time I heard about it. And I don't know why that is. Uh, maybe it's because a lot of Japanese modelers don't have airbrushes or, or whatever, but it's a thing. And Lincoln Wright talks a lot about it in, on his uh, YouTube channel and, and gives some instructions about how to do it. Because it is a weird thing. Uh, if you've ever worked with lacquers, you know that uh, as soon as you try to brush paint uh, one lacquer layer on top of another one, that things really go to hell because you just basically are reactivating the layer underneath and you blow right through it and it's very difficult to get good coverage or consistency. But that problem is actually uh, one of the just sort of magical characteristics of this particular style. And the uh, Japanese artists who were good at it use that fact to their advantage 
to create a lot of, uh, of really interesting tonal variety. And that's what I wanted to try to achieve. And so uh, to pay homage to that painting style, I decided to attempt that here with uh, this project. Um, and so these are all MRP lacquers brush painted straight out of the bottle. Um, and I learned some lessons there. They proved to be a little bit thin for that. Uh, but that wasn't actually such a terrible thing because it, it kept me from getting a lot of texture or brush marks. I mean, it's really relatively smooth, all things considered. But I had to do a lot of, uh, of layers uh, to get good coverage. Um, I think that there's parts of this where I have at least uh, three or four layers there. Um, and I also uh, wanted to do this kind of traditional machine and Krieger camouflage scheme where you've got uh, dark on top and lighter on the bottom. And it's, I wanted to also do this uh, thing that Lincoln talks about where you outline your darker color with a lighter color. And it kind of took on a life of its own because uh, I was sort of working off of a picture uh, in the color callout thing from the kit, um, but you know those are 2D, and when you start trying to wrap a camouflage scheme around something like this that's you know 3D, uh, it gets weird, and so it kind of just turned out the way it turned out, which I also kind of like because I think that makes it really unique. It's not exactly what I had in mind, and that's a little annoying, but I think it ended up looking cool, and most importantly. It looks odd, uh, which again is very much a part of the Japanese aesthetic with these, with these things. And uh, I, I wanted it to look odd and and different, and you know, not like the standard camouflage scheme. So, at any rate, that's that's the story there. Uh, it's an interesting technique. I would encourage people to try it. It's not what I would call easy. <laughs> you breathe a lot of lacquer fumes while you're doing it, but uh, it produces a look that I don't think is really easily um, reproducible using any other method. Okay, so that's pretty much all that there is to say about, uh, about Dopey. Again, I tried to create some commonality, uh, like they've both got the orange safety beacon, they've both got that kind of barcode thing on, on top, um, and then, like you can see with the numbering, okay, that GN4 thing, that's just some stupid thing I made up. Uh, because over here, what I attempted to show was that there was a code there that got repainted over here, and those are just from uh, stencils, uh, PE stencils that I had made for my Phantom project that I did last year. So since he's AF6, Dopey gets to be GN4, and because his code is in orange, and I want to link him to the sniper, he's got this orange shoot me sign on his head. Because, <laughs> yeah, uh, let's face it, that is tactically foolish, right? He's all, you know, got good camo colors for working in a sandy environment, but let's face it, uh, he's, you know, got a really bright advertisement as a target on his head. But hey, in a world where we probably have good infrared sensors or whatever, like you can see that Stompy has those in his vision gizmo. Well, so does the silencer guy have them in his vision gizmo. Uh, yeah, camouflage probably doesn't really matter a whole lot. So at any rate, that's the deal with the silencer. And how he came to be included is, sorry for all the camera wagging, um, I, I, I was originally not on any kind of timeline for this, but uh, back in August, Lincoln Wright of much uh, plastic, uh, paint on plastic fame and super cool Australian guy and studio modeler for the Machine and Krieger property that everybody knows, um, he decided to do a contest. Uh, where, uh, you know, any Machine and Krieger thing of any scale presented in any way, and he gave us until the end of October to do it. And the cool thing was, he allowed projects that had already been started, like this one, 
uh, as long as you basically just showed where you were when you began. And I was like, hey, that's great. There's no way I stand a chance in winning because he is going to attract some really high caliber artists. Uh, but it gives me an incentive to finish the thing. So I, that, that's, that's why I decided that, that was, you know, sort of a self-imposed deadline. And as I was working along, I decided, you know what, a figure would be fun to, if I could find one that, that really kind of worked with this. And I started looking around and I found this new Nuts Planet thing, but it actually had not been released in the United States yet. And this was in uh, like like right at the beginning of, of October. And uh, I emailed the guy who had it and he said, oh yeah, they should be here next week. And I thought, well, you know what, he's perfect. And if I finish everything else in time, like my little camera effect there, that's the, you know, me doing everything else effect. <laughs> anyway, uh, I said, okay, self, if you finish doing all the other stuff it, with, you know, enough time to, to do a good job on the figure, then add him. That's like my little bonus reward. And I did. I finished everything else with about a week to spare. And I did the silencer character in exactly seven days from beginning to end. And I feel like I did okay. Now, maybe, you know, maybe not great. I don't claim to be a figure painter. I have absolutely no authority in that area. But I feel like I did okay. And I did everything I wanted to do. I didn't rush it, but I did, you know, I did work steadily every day for probably three hours each day on average to, uh, to get him done. And, uh, you know, it's my basic thing that I've developed for doing figures uh, that I feel like is effective and efficient while not necessarily being, uh, you know, uh, tied to any particular figure painting uh, methodology. And so basically, I try to base coat everything using airbrush or paintbrush to be the midtones. And then I come back and I, I do the shadows and the highlights using oils and um, just, you know, working my way through it. And part of that was made a lot easier by the fact that this is a relatively simple little kit that's got like nine parts, I think. Um, and, it, and it went together, I mean, okay. Um, I mean, the figure itself is almost complete. The uh, only separate parts are his rifle and his right hand, his giant sniper gun thing there, and then the uh, articulated uh, exoskeleton suit uh, thing that goes on his uh, arms are, are separate pieces. And those were a bitch. I'm not even gonna lie. Getting getting that uh, getting getting that stuff assembled and and getting it to all connect properly was a bitch, and I will say to anybody who's interested in making this little figure that you should definitely spend a little time studying how it, go, how it needs to go together um, and making sure that everything does fit because the engineering is pretty good. Like there's some little, uh, some little knobs on the, uh, uh, like the upper arm piece is supposed to connect to the shoulder piece in only one way, which is good engineering. But the little knobs that are supposed to make that happen did not fit well enough to just go together. Um, and so I ended up having to kind of fudge that. Uh, so, you know, if you're going to build this little thing, you definitely want to check the fit of all the parts. And I didn't do a good job of that. It's kind of hard. Uh, to dry fit things like this. Um, I, I, I knew I was able to dry fit the, the hands and the, and the left forearm, but that was really about it. Um, but it's, it's pretty good. But the only you know, real gripe I have is that there is no instruction sheet in the box. There's no exploded view, and you'd be like, well, yeah, it's a figure. How many different ways can it go together? Yeah. Yeah, that's still bullshit. There should be an exploded view at a minimum so you know which parts go where and that you can understand how they are, you know, the engineering intent with how they're supposed to assemble. Um, because the, there's three or four views on the outside of the box that kind of help, but still, not really. And as far as I'm concerned, when you've done a, when you've created something like this out of, uh, you know, ZBrush or any kind of CAD software, there's just no excuse for not doing good exploded views in your instructions. It's just, you know, it's just really re relatively easy and uh, just, you know, 
not not cool to uh, leave that out for a fifty dollar figure especially but overall i was really impressed with the detail and the quality of the molding this is clearly created from a 3d printed master pattern but i didn't find a single evidence of build layer lines anywhere so super impressed with the overall quality of the thing the molding was really good the molding lines were almost non-existent uh, and, and I, you know, do feel like it was definitely a really high quality figure, and I'd recommend anything. If, if everything else Nuts Planet does uh, is is of the same level of quality, then I'd recommend uh, pretty much anything they do. So, uh, anyhow, I think that's about it, and this has already been a pretty long video, so let's just call it a day. Okay, so there it is. <laughs> that's a. Uh, that was a lot, I know, uh, but it, it is what it is. It was kind of a, it was kind of a lot to to build as well. I have worked on nothing else for the last two months straight. Uh, it's you know it's been a, it's been a pretty uh, a pretty involved project. Uh, you know, of course, like all my stupid ideas, it ended up being uh, more difficult and more involved than I saw in my head when. I was, uh, you know, imagining all this. But anyway, it's done. It feels good. I'm pretty happy with the overall result. I feel like it was a uh, uh, a lot of learning and that it uh, pushed my weathering skills especially uh, quite a bit. And um, I'm always happy for that. So at any rate, I hope you guys think it's cool. And as always, I appreciate you watching. Much love.